Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every single Monday, I strive to get these update videos out so that you can stay in the loop about all news relating to SpaceX Starship development, launch events, and of course, everything else that I found worthy of sharing. This week is no different to any other. Tons of Starship news, launches from SpaceX, Rocket Lab, Soyuz, and big news about Virgin Orbit and its competitors, NASA's continued certification of its upgraded RS-25 engines for Artemis, and much, much more. Let's begin. Let's start off with Starship news, specifically Stage Zero, or rather, SpaceX's repairs to Stage Zero after the massive damage the launch pad sustained following the Starship orbital flight test. In addition to the usual removal of debris, debris being expelled concrete and rebar, and of course the pouring of replacement concrete and rebar, SpaceX have been making progress on the orbital launch table. Last week, in fact, teams removed the booster quick disconnect shielding and the flexible hoses that connect to the ship, which supply the vehicle with propellant and power. In this Lab Padre footage, you can see the departure of the booster quick disconnect hood itself from the site. All these changes signify one of two things. One, and hopefully this isn't the case, Booster 7 did so much damage to the launch area after generating the rock tornado that these pieces are damaged beyond repair and need replacing. Or two, lest we forget that Booster 7 was the last in the lineage of boosters that used hydraulic engine actuation among a laundry list of other things, and that starting from Booster 9 onwards, different hardware, or at least upgraded hardware, is going to be required for the booster quick disconnect. It's not just the booster quick disconnect arm that was removed. On the 21st of May, the Starship quick disconnect was removed as well. Is this for upgrades or repairs due to the rock tornado damage or complete replacement due to the aforementioned rock tornado? It'll be interesting to see what happens. Elon supposedly still wants Starship to perform another orbital flight test in about a month now if his timeline hasn't changed. And although I, and most people, have been skeptical of this timeline from the day he stated it, this looks like another nail in the coffin that another orbital launch ain't happening anytime soon. Speaking of the damage dealt by the Starship orbital flight test, we here all love Lab Padre. Here's a camera used by one of his photographers, Nick D'Alessandro. It's a Canon EOS Rebel T7 DSLR unit. Well, at least this is what they usually look like. Here is how Nicky's unit looks after capturing the historic Starship launch. I'm pretty sure a lick of paint and some Sharpie will fix that. <laughs> to help support Lab Padre and all the other Starbase photographers, don't forget to follow them on Twitter. They're all linked down below. And of course, signing up to their Patreons really helps keep them afloat. As for the other things relating to the orbital launch site, we saw what appeared to be the delivery of a truck laden with 20 mysterious crates, which we believe to be the new hold down clamps for the orbital launch ring. It is believed that these were redesigned to account for the upgraded engine isolation and shielding present on Booster 9 and future Super Heavies. Ship 25 remains on the sub-orbital launch pad, and last week it was unhooked from the crane, leaving it to stand free and proud. At some point in the near future, SpaceX will be conducting a static fire of all six of the vehicle's Raptor engines. I can't wait to see it. So how are future vehicles coming along? Well, Lab Padre streams captured the moment of Booster 11's grid fins being installed last week, bringing this Super Heavy one giant leap closer to being flight ready. Prior to this moment, we also saw Booster 11's liquid methane tank grow taller, now at 9 out of 13 rings in height. We also saw some more segments of Ship 29 being moved into the high bay. And you know, speaking of the high bay, this is one of the few iconic Starbase structures that will remain after the next phase of SpaceX's radical overhauls to the site. SpaceX is preparing to remove all of this in order to expand the existing Star Factory building. This may have the unfortunate side effect of making it harder for us YouTubers to cover Starship updates as more and more things are locked behind closed factory doors. But hopefully this isn't the case, at least too much. While the low bay hasn't begun disassembly, it appears to have been completely emptied of all hardware. In addition to the expansion of the Star Factory, SpaceX are still making big steps towards the construction of the new high bay. As you can see here, it continues to rise higher and higher. Towards the end of last week, SpaceX finally released an official Starship Orbital Flight Test recap video, giving us lots of new amazing views of that historic day. Some highlights for me were the close-up view of the launch. As you can see, it definitely looks like we can confirm that two to three engines were not firing at liftoff. We also got some amazing onboard shots of the ship at high altitude and during that infamous tumble. 
Some heat shield tiles can be seen flying off during this, but for the most part, the heat shield appears to be reasonably intact. The video ended with confirmation of what we all suspected, but glad to see put in writing, as it were. The next orbital flight test will be Booster 9 and Ship 25. Now, I for one think the launch name 9 to 5 has a good ring to it. <laughs> what do you think? The launch after this one will presumably be Ship 28 and Booster 10. Booster 10 itself looks pretty much ready for its test campaign. SpaceX have now moved it out of the Mega Bay and placed it into the Rocket Garden, before presumably moving it to either the Macy's test site or to the launch area for cryo testing. In last week's episode of Space This Week, and remember to subscribe by the way so that you get every update from this show delivered straight to your sub feed. Oh, and while I'm at it, please do drop a little like on this video if you are finding it informative. It really helps you stay above water in the savage tides of the almighty algorithm and all of that. Uh, anyway, yes, last week I covered the big news that Blue Origin is back in the moon landing race with their own human landing system lander. But how is SpaceX, the sole contractor for the human landings of both Artemis 3 and Artemis 4, getting along with theirs? Well, we think we have spotted hardware for their lander at Starbase. Twitter user The Space Engineer put this animation together using resources from RGV aerial photography. And here, I hope that my usage of their photos counts as fair use for illustrating how The Space Engineer created this render of how these components come together. As you can see, this may well form the basis of the elevator system that will lower astronauts down to the surface of the moon. If true, this is a huge step for SpaceX and Artemis, and I'm super excited to see how this develops. Speaking of stuff I talked about in last week's episode, I mentioned the imminent launch of Axiom 2. Well, I'm pleased to say that it did in fact happen. Peggy Whitson, John Schofner, Ali Akani, and Rayanna Barnawi, the astronauts of the Axiom 2 mission, have successfully made their way on board the International Space Station after the SpaceX Dragon hatch opened on Monday the 22nd of May. Axiom 2's crew, who comprise the second private crew mission to the station in the Axiom program, have joined the Expedition 69 crew members already present on the station. They are NASA astronauts Frank Rubio, Woody Hoberg and Stephen Bowen, UAE astronaut Sultan al Niyadi, as well as Roscosmos cosmonauts Dmitry Petalin, Andrei Fedyeyev and Sergei Prokopiev. During their time on the ISS, the Axiom 2 crew will conduct more than 20 science and technology experiments in areas like human physiology and physical sciences. These experiments aim to expand knowledge for the benefit of life on Earth in areas such as healthcare, materials, technology development and industrial advancements. Following all of this, and if weather conditions allow, the Axiom Space astronauts are scheduled to depart from the space station on the 30th of May. They will make their return to Earth aboard Dragon and perform a splashdown landing off the coast of Florida. Axiom 2 wasn't the only mission launched to the International Space Station last week. On the 24th of May, a Soyuz 2.1A launched Progress MS-23 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Progress spacecraft are uncrewed resupply missions from Roscosmos, and this particular launch was the 174th Progress mission. This launch will supply Expeditions 69 and 70, and it carried over 2,500 kilos of various items to the station. Specifically, this shipment included 600 kilograms of propellant to refuel the ISS, 630 kilograms of drinking water, and 40 kilograms of pressurized gases. The remaining 1,290 kilograms comprises a wide range of items, including research equipment, tools, consumables, and kits for scientific experiments. Additionally, there were provisions for the crew of Expedition 69, such as clothing, food, and hygiene products, ensuring their well-being and supporting their work during their time on the station. One of my favourite rockets in operation is Falcon Heavy, and in particular its Arab 6A mission, which was historic because this was the first and to date only Falcon Heavy mission to recover all three Falcon cores, at least before the centre core was destroyed due to rough sea conditions. Why do I bring this up? Well, last week we had another Arabsat mission. This was Arabsat 7B, and while it was sadly not cool enough to warrant a Falcon Heavy, it was still supported by SpaceX's ever-reliable Falcon 9 Block 5. The rocket was supposed to launch in the early hours of Thursday, the 25th of May, but sadly we saw a launch abort, and so the launch was pushed back to Saturday, the 27th of May. The rocket took off successfully, delivering the satellite to a geosynchronous transfer orbit. Following stage separation, the rocket's first stage landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship, which was stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. This first stage was B-1062 and had previously supported 13 missions. 
GPS-3, SVO-4 and SVO-5, Inspiration-4, Axiom-1, Nilesat-301, OneWeb-17 and seven Starlink missions. Now, going back to the Progress MS-23 launch, this wasn't the only Soyuz mission to happen last week. On Friday the 26th of May, a Soyuz 2.1A launched the Condor FKA No. 1 satellite from Russia's Vostochny Cosmodrome. According to Roscosmos, the Condor FKA No. 1 is a civilian Earth observation satellite. And that's about all they really shared. On the 25th of May, we saw the third launch of the South Korean Nuri rocket. For this flight, Nuri carried eight satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit from the Naro Space Center. The rocket itself is a three-stage liquid propellant vehicle developed by the Korea Aerospace Research Institute designed to, in their words, directly put a 1.5-ton application satellite into a 600 to 800 km sun-synchronous orbit. Last week, we also saw an Electron rocket take to the skies from the Mahia Peninsula, carrying the Tropics 2 payload on behalf of NASA on the 26th of May. This was the final launch of NASA's Tropics constellation. The Tropics satellites will work together to measure temperature, moisture profiles, and precipitation in tropical systems with unparalleled temporal frequency, providing data that will allow scientists to study the dynamic processes that occur in the inner core of storms. The first Tropics launch was handled by Astra, which of course failed to reach orbit. Now, the original announced plan was that NASA would wait for Astra's Rocket 4 to be operational and then continue launching the Tropic satellites with Astra. But it looks like Rocket Lab have been asked to step in, as they were awarded the launch contract for all remaining Tropics satellites, the first being on the 8th of May, and the second and final being last week on the 26th. That wasn't the only big success from Rocket Lab in the past week, but before I get to that, some sad news now. Virgin Orbit are officially gone for good, and has sold a number of its assets to various other rocket companies. This includes Rocket Lab, Strato Launch, and Vast Space. Virgin Orbit officially filed for bankruptcy back in April, but that was Chapter 11 bankruptcy, meaning that there was still a chance that they could live on. But now that it has shut down and sold all of its things, including the Cosmic Girl 747 that launches the rockets themselves, it looks like it is finally curtains. So back to Rocket Lab. They have apparently managed to secure Virgin Orbit's former headquarters, including its machinery, for a cool $16 million. And all of this is located only a couple of blocks from its existing headquarters, giving them a very tidy score in all of this. This acquisition will no doubt help them continue towards getting Neutron up and running and finally giving SpaceX some competition when it comes to reusable rocket stages, something I am super excited to see happen. While it's the end of Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic is still going strong. On Thursday last week, they made their return to flight mission, the first suborbital space mission performed by VSS Unity since Richard Branson's flight in July 2021. This was a big test for the space tourism company, taking place just before it starts taking members of the public on trips. We made it to space, Virgin Galactic tweeted, and then 11 minutes later, they said the spaceship had landed smoothly. This is the fifth time that Virgin Galactic have gone to space. The vehicle took off from Spaceport America in New Mexico on this, its final check flight. There were six Virgin Galactic employees on board for the trip to the edge of space. Virgin Galactic wants to start their first paid trips in late June, but of course that depends on this flight going well. So far, not a lot has been shared about this, which is hopefully a good sign. <laughs> VSS Unity can hold up to six passengers and two pilots. Virgin Galactic has 600 people who have already reserved seats for future flights, and they've paid between $200,000 and $250,000 for each ticket. And in 2021, the prices for seats started at a staggering $450,000 per passenger. I guess space really ain't cheap. NASA news now. They recently carried out another exciting hot fire test of an upgraded RS-25 engine on the 23rd of May. This test was another major step in certifying the production of the new engines for upcoming space missions. The operators at the Fred Hayes Test Stand, located at NASA's Stennis Space Center, fired up a certification engine for an impressive duration of over 8 minutes, or specifically 500 seconds. This duration matches the required firing time for launching NASA's SLS rocket during Artemis missions to deep space. During the test, the engine was pushed to an impressive power level of up to 113%, exceeding the necessary 111% power level for launch. This extra power provides an additional margin of safety and operational performance. 
This hot fire test was the eighth in a series of 12, specifically designed to certify the production of new RS-25 engines for future missions, beginning with Artemis V. Exciting developments like these pave the way for our future deep space exploration, bringing us closer to new discoveries and remarkable missions. Speaking of new discoveries, may I now allow you to discover the names of the amazing people now scrolling on the left of your screen. They are my Patreon donors and YouTube channel members. Links to join their ranks can be found down below, as it's their generosity that allows me to continue making this content for all of you. If you want to see your name in lights, then you know what to do. But otherwise, there are two video suggestions on screen that you should think you'll like. Hopefully they are good picks for you. Anyway, this has been Matt Lown with Space This Week. That was a weirdly formal sign-off. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.